We that love the Lord and let our joys be known Join in a song with sweet accord Join in a song with sweet accord And thus surround the throne And thus surround the throne We're marching Beyond the beautiful city of God. Second verse. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly king. But children of the heavenly king may speak their joys abroad. May speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city. Fourth verse. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Just before we pray, let me mention some prayer requests I was just given. Uh, the young man that had attempted suicide, Paige's friend, um, finally passed away, and so let's pray for his family. Gene's friend down in West Virginia such a close friend he can't remember their name but she has bone cancer so let's pray for her Gloria's son gary has something wrong hurt his back yesterday or sometime at the end of this week so pray for him and darla has surgery on thursday so remember her in your prayers if you would and tom why don't you lead us in prayer this morning would you please
All right, pick up your board and let's make some announcements. This one I'm going to make out of order because it's really important. We have a young man coming to preach for us tonight. His name is Pete Cratifilio, I think is how you pronounce his last name. I've only known him four years and still can't pronounce his last name. Um, we are, we're considering prayerfully, no decisions made, whether we're going to have some young preacher come in and help us with our visitation, our youth group, and all that kind of stuff. And Pete's going to be one of those men. So he's going to be here tonight. If you're able to be here, I would encourage you to put yourself out. He'll be preaching for us, and uh, we want as many of you to come as possible. Deacons meeting after the morning service this morning. For the two that are here, we need to have a short meeting. So if you'll be, be around for that. Choir practice at 6. Next Sunday... May the 10th is Mother's Day, and so we are having in the evening service the Joyful Sound Ladies Ensemble from the college. Dr. Miller said he would preach a sweet message for you ladies, and you do want to come back for that. I know it's Mother's Day and a lot of times, but bring your moms and bring them back so they can hear these girls sing. These girls, in my opinion, are very good. I enjoy them. Ladies meeting, note the date change. It's now going to be Thursday, May the 14th at 7 p.m., Note the date change. Do what? Yeah, Carolyn was afraid she was going to miss that baseball game. So they changed the date. And then Sunday, May 17th, is community service in the evening. And then the 27th, um, I, I left it off by accident, off the bulletin. Not by accident, it wouldn't let me put it on there. Uh, Phyllis and Darla are supposed to have cakes that evening for the birthday bash. You may not be up to that. So you make two, Phyllis. Okay. My mom, Ruth, will make one of them. You going to make the other one? Okay, good. What, what flavor? My favorite? Well, if I tell you, you won't make it. Well, so I'm not going to tell you. I'm one step ahead of you, Phyllis. And then coming up on the 31st is our fifth Sunday of the month, so we're, that's also National Parents' Day, so we want to celebrate that. Uh, fellowship after the morning service, uh, 
they didn't ask me what my favorite is for that meal either. And then after, after the evening, or during the evening service, we'll have our fifth Sunday sing. So everybody, be in your place this month. It's going to be a good month. Uh, here's, here's one truth about coming to hear Pete preach tonight is you have invested four years into the college. This is part of your investment. One of the uh, graduates that the, he's graduating, as a matter of fact, Tuesday, and uh, you have invested in four years of his life by investing in the college. And so you want to come see the type of product that's coming out of it. You've met some of them already. One of them we had preached here before, uh, Brother Josh, what's his last name? Kind of as bad as Gene. Anyway, yeah, Josh, anyway, he preached for us one, one anniversary here a couple of years ago. So we want you to come back, please, and, and uh, be in your place tonight so Pete can uh, see our folks and you can get to meet him also. All right, the next number in our books are 185. 185. All four verses. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. Thus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how Wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He had no Calvary and suffered and died alone. Oh, how marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my savior's love for me when with the ransom in glory his face i at last shall see Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How wonderful shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Michael, lead us in our offertory prayer, if you would, please. Number 86, so let's stand together and sing In the Garden, all three verses. Number 86.
I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known i'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. To me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known Thank you. Be seated. And Janice is going to sing a special for us this morning. This is an old song, so some of you may remember it. <clears throat> Soft as the voice of an angel, breathing a lesson on earth, hope with a gentle persuasion, whispers her comforting word wait till the darkness is over wait till the tempest is done hope for the sunshine tomorrow after the shower is gone Whispering hope, oh, how well come thy voice, making my heart in its sorrow rejoice. <clears throat> hope as an anchor so steadfast rends the dark veil for the soul whether the master has entered robbing the grave of its goal come then oh come glad frustrate <clears throat> come to my sad weary heart 
Come, O oh, helpless hope of glory, never, oh, never depart. Whispering hope, oh, how well come thy voice, making my heart in its sorrow rejoice. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we just finished this chapter Wednesday night in our Wednesday night Bible study. Wednesday night Bible study. That may surprise some of you. We still have services on Wednesday night. A little tongue in cheek there. Got to be careful I'll bite my tongue, but anyway. And we uh, talked about this chapter, but in a little different light than we're going to talk about it this morning. I'm going to take time to read the whole chapter so you get a good overview of, of what it says. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1 says, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance, that you, be, may, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now... By the same word are kept in store, reserved in, unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the words that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God? wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Wherefore, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be ye diligent, that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them things, these things, in which are sometimes hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest any of ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about the character of God in these last days. Uh, we, are, we are living in as the... Uh, epistles tell us uh, the end times. Paul in 2 Timothy 3.13 said this, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And we can look around us and we can see the evilness, we can see the wickedness, and we can see it growing on every hand. 
I read yesterday in the papers that there is a, a uh, movie mogul director that overseas was given a, a, a top honor, an award, and yet in our country he's wanted as a pedophile. So we see that constantly uh, the evil things that men are doing is, seems to be getting worse. Uh, ISIS, I read yesterday, has, has uh, killed 300 more Christians. Uh, we see the slaughter of innocent people, civilians, and many of them Christians overseas. We see in our own country a, a horrible black uh, ink splot on our nation with the riots and the protesting. We see that in some respects probably there are some bad policemen. But I'm going to say this in the middle of all this, I still support policemen. Where would we be if there were not policemen on the street? And so we need to support them. These guys that were charged, um, I'm going to use a word that, that the, the, the uh, people that are doing the um, uh, protesting in Boston or in Baltimore would hate, but they're rushing to a lynching. And they've not given this time to be fleshed out yet. They don't want the truth to come out. They want a guilty plea to come out, whether it's true or not. And they've, they've all but said that. So I'm concerned about the state of our nation, but I'm more concerned about the state of our Christians in our nation. We're a big part of the problem. And it's because we've not lived as God wants us to. And so when we think about all of those things, I want to start with this concept before we ever get into the message that God's character has never changed. He's still a God of holiness and righteousness and judgment. And we'll see that in this passage as we go through it this morning. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin. Our Father, we thank you that we can go to your word and always find that absolute truth. We can go to your word and find encouragement. We can go to your word and find strength. We can go to your word and find comfort. But most of all, Father, I pray that we would go to your word this morning and find conviction. Lord, as we talked about in the Sunday school hour, What's done for an eternal view and done for eternity has to be done by you. We can't do that. And so as I preach this morning, I understand that my words can't change hearts, but the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, can speak to hearts. And so I pray that that would be what happens this morning. I pray that if we are not going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our heart, we would not expect anything different to happen in our lives than has already happened. And we would not get any closer to you than we've already attained that closeness. And so I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would have freedom in our hearts this morning. Guide my thinking. Help me not to say anything that shouldn't be said, but to say boldly anything that should be said. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I would mention to you is in these first ten verses, and it talks here about, I believe, the integrity of God. Here the scoffers walking in these last days are basically making this charge. God's a liar. 2,000 years ago, Jesus promised that he would come again. He made that promise on several different occasions. One time, uh, he told his, his uh, uh, people in the upper room, his disciples, that if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there he may be also. Uh, the men in white apparel on the day of ascension made that same statement, that why stand ye here looking up, they said the same Jesus which you see taken from you will in like manner come again. We have the promise that Jesus is coming again all through Scripture. We have the promise, and that promise in Scripture is a promise given by God. I don't know if you've noticed or saw this quick or, uh, clearly or not, but as we read this passage, Peter himself calls the writings of the Apostle Paul Scripture. In other words, he gave them God's authority from one disciple to another disciple, from one apostle to another apostle, he called the very writings of God, of Paul, Scripture. We have the truth of God's Word in His Word, and we have the truth of God in that Word so we can be certain of that. God is not to be questioned about His integrity. What God has said, He will do. What God has done, He's always done for the right reasons and the right motivation. Our God is a righteous God and a just God and a holy God and a God of judgment. And everything he has ever promised, he has fulfilled. He fulfilled to the letter Jesus' first coming. We have no right to question that because Jesus did come in the flesh. Now, you can go clear back to Genesis and you can find that questioning of the integrity of God started in the Garden of Eden. 
And it started with a, 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 an entity called Satan. As a serpent, he asked Eve if God had really said that. He planted doubt in the mind of Eve that God had said what he said. And then he planted that uh, question about whether God meant what he said or not. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I ha somehow just believe that what God means he says and what God says he means. I tell folks when I teach Bible college and I teach them the classes on hermeneutics that we want to understand exactly what the Bible says. This is the only book that we have that gives us the very mind of God. No other book gives us that. It may talk about it, but this book tells us the mind of God. Other books may talk about truth, but it's this book that gives us the absolute truth. It's this book that God has placed his stamp of approval on. It's this book we call the Bible that we have as an authority. As we talked about in Sunday school, which some of you missed this morning, we still have it in this church. Uh, in Sunday school, we talked about how that the word of God is our yardstick. It is the authority for us. And we have no right to ignore it. Why? Because if you ignore God's absolute, there is nothing absolute. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious about some things that happened in the riots this week, and I'm going to throw them out interspersed here. I'm curious about how this was a racial matter when three of the policemen were black and three of the policemen were white. How does that become a racial matter? You've got black police officers called racist now because they did their job and, and put a man in, into the, the paddy wagon, and I'm not sure what happened to the guy. Uh, I don't know if maybe one of the policemen wasn't a bad egg, but I know this. I know that it's not a racial component when you got three in whites and three blacks and they put a man in a police custody. So what, 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 where does that confusion come from? Well, it comes from people not having an absolute. They're calling, so they say, for justice. Well, what is justice? Is justice what you and I think it is or is there an absolute? Well, in our nation, we live as a nation of people controlled and, and, and ruled by laws. We're not ruled by a king, even though our president sometimes thinks he is. We're not ruled by kings and princes. We're ruled by laws. And our laws say, does not matter who you are or where you're from, a man's innocent until proven guilty. Is that still not in the law books? I'm thinking I never heard that being repealed. So everybody has that presumption of innocence. That is, of course, unless you're going up for the IRS. Then all bets are off. When you go for the IRS, you're guilty. Just figure out where you're going to get the money from. But the truth is, there's no basis. If, if everybody has a right to call justice what they're thinking of justice is, there's no absolute. If my concept of justice and Carolyn's concept of justice and Phyllis's concept of justice and Sharon's concept of justice are all different, who's to say what justice is unless we can go to the Word of God and find it out? Unless there's something that lays down that absolute. And so when we have the Bible, we have an absolute. Why do we need an absolute? Because men will always do that which is right in their own eyes, just like in the book of Judges. Men always do what's right in their own eyes. The Bible here tells us that they question God about everything, even down to the questioning of his creation. They question the coming. Jesus is coming. Well, where is he? Ha, ha, he's not come yet. That means he's never coming. Ha, 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 ha. That's like going through the winter and getting up to about February and say, well, I'm not catching a cold. I'm not getting a cold. Ha, 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 ha. And the next day, guess what you make up, may wake up with? a cold or the flu. We don't know what's coming tomorrow, but God does. And we have the promise. He said Jesus is coming again. We can scoff at it and people can make light of it because they don't want to accept the reality that one day they're going to stand face to face with Jesus Christ and give answer for themselves. That's going to be a day of accountability and that's going to be a day of reckoning. And that also is going to be a day of pure justice where there is no question about right or wrong. The Bible says in Romans that there will be no excuse. Every mouth will be stopped. There will be no excuses. So when folks stand before Jesus, they're not going to say, well, I didn't know, or my mom was mean to me, or my dad didn't treat me right, 
or for whatever reason we come up with for disobeying what's right and wrong, it's not going to hold water in God's court of justice. So his coming is a coming of reality. His creation is a creation of reality. And yet people still today question that. I have a problem with a scientist who can see the complexity of all this creation has in it and still wonder that they, they, I wonder that they don't believe that there was a creator, that there was not somebody who put it all together. This building was built 200 years ago or so. It was 19, uh, 1892, I think the cornerstone out there said. And since 1892, do you think anybody ever walked in this building and said, hmm, a bunch of blocks were just dropped here and all of a sudden the ground shook and a building popped up? That doesn't make sense. We have a soundboard back there. Nobody walks in this building and thinks that somebody didn't put that soundboard together. But when it comes to creation, suddenly we have to do away with the Creator if we're going to walk in our evil imaginations, as it talks about, if we're going to have only thoughts of evil continually, we have to do away with the Creator. We have to do away with somebody who's greater and bigger and higher and more intelligent than we are. Man wants to elevate himself, so he uh, uh, starts to question the integrity or the truthfulness of God. But I tell you the truth, God explains his integrity. In verse 8, he says, But love, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The way we try to question God's integrity is say we know more than God does. Because we think God works on our economy. We think God works on our time frame. We think God works in our manner and in our way. He's told us, my ways are above your ways. My thoughts are above your thoughts. How could we ever respect a God that we understood everything that there was to be understood about him? How could he be God if my mind could fathom everything that God knows? How could he be God if in my mind I could do, and in my mind and ability, I could do everything that God does? God explains his integrity here. It is not that he's not coming. It's not that he did not create. It's not that his word is not true. It's that he's being long-suffering toward men so that they can be saved. But he tells us that this, this uh, long-suffering is really not much of a long-suffering time period at all for God. How many here above the age of 50? Raise your hand. You remember when you used to hear old folks say, time just flies the older you get. How many of you have heard that? Raise your hand. How many of you, when you first heard that, you kind of scoffed at it and said, that's crazy? Well, of course we all did. How many of you are finding out that that's absolutely true now? It just seems like time flies, doesn't it? Well, let's put it on a human basis. How old is God? He's for eternity. So what is time to somebody that has been here for eternity? It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Now, I know that there are some times when God has placed his, his uh, plan in the framework of human events and human time. Uh, why do you think that the wise men knew when Jesus was going to be born? Because he added up the prophecies in Daniel and came up with the, day, the time uh, uh, line to give the birth of Jesus. But when we're talking about Jesus' second coming, God says through the word of God that no man knoweth, no man knoweth the day, no man knoweth the hour, not the angels, not even Jesus knows that's reserved to the Father. He knows, but he's not given us a time frame. He does not work. God doesn't wake up some morning and say, well, let me see, it's May, May has started, I, I think all of a sudden we ought to do something different for May. Well, let's plan out what we're going to do in September. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't work on a time frame like we do. When the time is right and the last person's come to know Jesus as Savior and the last wicked event that breaks the straw, that breaks the camel's back in God's sight happens, God will send Jesus back. When he comes, it's going to be the proof that he has indeed integrity. So I want you to look in verse 9 with me. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
Does God have a rush to judgment? The answer is no. He doesn't have a rush to judgment. He's not in a hurry to get Jesus back on earth for one reason. Anybody want to take a guess what that one reason is? He wants more people to be saved. God is not willing that how many should perish? Any. No one should perish in God's plan. He does not want that to happen. But men, because of their lack of belief in God, choose to disobey and choose to reject. But God's plan in that long-suffering stage is not because he's slack concerning his promises. He will fulfill it, but he's given men and women and boys and girls time to get saved more every year. Down at Bayview Baptist last week, they had some special days. They had special parties and stuff, and their bus routes and, and on the uh, parks and stuff, outdoor meetings, and they had 63 people saved in one day. The year that I went to the Ukraine back in 95, we had 969 people saved in one week. That's because of the long-suffering of God. I don't know how many people we'll have saved in this church this year, but we'll have some. We already had a few. And I know before the end of the year, probably we'll have some more. Every person that gets saved can thank God that he is a long-suffering God. Every mother that has a child that trusts Christ as their Savior can thank God that he's a long-suffering God. Every child that has a parent or a brother or a sister or a loved one that gets saved can thank God that he's a long-suffering God. What if he'd cut it off in 1960? I wouldn't have been able to get saved. I would have not had the opportunity of knowing Jesus as my Savior. What if he cut it off the year before you got saved? Then you wouldn't have gotten saved. But the truth is he gave us that privilege. He's long-suffering. He shows his integrity. He shows his integrity because he is not going to be in a hurry. He is going to wait and come back in his absolute time. He also makes his prediction in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise. The elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Men say, well, God's not going to destroy the earth again. Oh, yes, yes, he is. Yes, he is. How do you know that? Because he says he is. Well, we haven't seen it happen. No, I wasn't here when it happened the first time. Now, Gene might have been here just after the ark landed, but I've not been around that long. Gene and I are both getting forgetful. I was teasing him this morning about not remembering that lady's name. And he says, that's not the worst part, preacher. I forgot my belt this morning. <laughs> Well, we all forget things, Gene. It's all right. We love you. But God's judgment is as sure as it was when it fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. God's judgment is as sure as it was when that first raindrop fell out of the skies and the flood became a reality. Can you imagine that 120 years that Noah preached? How many converts did he have in 120 years? None outside of his family, correct? For 120 years, he was a, a failure as a preacher on earth, by earth standards. But for 120 years, he preached righteousness. And what did people say? Well, what are you talking about, Noah? You're building a boat? Well, what do you need a boat out here in the middle of this wasteland for? This dry, arid place? Why do you need a boat? Well, the Lord says it's going to rain. Well, what do you mean rain, Noah? It's never rained before. You sure it's going to rain? Well, God says it's going to rain. I believe him. I'm building a boat just like he told me because we're going to have a big gully washer. Can you imagine how many times he put up with their ridicule and their mocking? I can imagine in my mind they came out and surrounded that boat often. They watched him and his, and his children and family working up on the sides of that ark. And they pointed at him and laughed at him. Noah, you think you ought to make it a little bigger? It's not quite big enough. Noah, where's it going to steer it from? Noah, what are you going to put in that boat? Mocking and, and laughing and scoffing. And they're out, day, out there one day, and maybe all of a sudden the, the animals start coming and filling the ark. You'd think that would change their mind, wouldn't you? 
Well, Noah, why are you taking all those animals on the ark? Well, Noah says, I don't have any idea. I didn't have anything to do with it. God brought them up here and put them on the ark. Well, why are you putting them? I'm telling you, it's going to be a worldwide flood. You're going to be destroyed. Nah, yeah, right, right. What's your trick? What's your animal training trick that got all those animals on it? God did it. Yeah, right. And it's going to rain, and you need a boat because water is going to be a gully washer. Sure, we've heard it all before. For 120 years now, that's all we've heard from you. And all of a sudden, the door closes. And they're standing outside the ark. And the first drop of rain hits on their forehead. By then it was too late. Can I mention to you that by this the same account, that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes again? People are going to scoff. People are going to scoff even after the church is raptured and we're gone. People are going to laugh and they're going to scoff and they're going to say, well, well, the, the UFOs came and got them. Well, it was a secret, uh, secret working by the government to kind of cut back on the, the problems that we're having with overpopulation and with, uh, you know, the, the warm house or the, uh, what do they call it? Warm house, of, what is it? Greenhouse. Greenhouse effect. Thank you, Art. <laughs> cut back on all that stuff. We won't need to have as many people. Or, okay, whatever you say. Well, you keep laughing. You keep mocking. One day... Jesus is coming in judgment. And one day, the Bible says when he comes, every eye will see him, and they'll know that he's back. But in verse 10, the last part, it also says that when he comes back, he's coming back with indignation. Coming back, the world is going to be made over again. He's coming back. There's a meekness, though, a scene with this anger. There's a meekness seen with this indignation. There's a meekness associated with it because the day of the Lord shall come shows that he is patiently waiting. The day of the Lord will come. Will come. We don't know when. God could have it happen today, but in his meekness and patience, he's waiting. But there's also a mightiness associated with this. Dr. R.G. Lee said in his famous sermon, Payday Someday, everybody's expecting payday. But I want you to understand, payday is not always on Friday. And there's coming a time when payday from God will be a reality. And it won't be when everybody's expecting it. Then we see something in chapter uh, 3 and verse 14. He says there, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be, may be found of him uh, in peace without spot and blameless. And, uh, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brethren Paul. And he goes on to talk about Paul. But here in this, this passage, he talks about what God insists that we do. In verses 11 and 12, he tells us that we're to be looking for something different. We're to be looking for the day that Jesus comes. We're to be looking with expectancy that Jesus could come at, at any moment. We're to be looking and understanding that what God has said he will bring about. And by our expectancy, it should change our lives. We should be careful in our looking. Verse 14 says we should be right in our living. In him, peace without spot and blameless. Why do we argue with everybody? Why is there so much turmoil that breaks churches apart? If it's not pride, somebody tell me what it is. If it's not sin in one form or another, somebody tell me what it is. We all have seen it happen. And maybe in, even in this room, some people have been affected by it. Lay that baggage aside and live in peace. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. We have been promised, according to Philippians, that peace that passes all understanding. We don't have to live at war with everybody else around us. Who's your enemy? Who's your enemy? How many enemies do you have? I don't claim enemies. I just don't have time for enemies. Now, they may claim me as an enemy, but I don't have time for enemies. One enemy we all should face is Satan. You're not my enemy. But if you knew what I said about you over the dinner table last week, I don't care. 
You're not my enemy. I'm more concerned about what God says than what you say. We don't have to worry about other people. We don't need enemies. But if you knew what they did to me, doesn't matter. Dead men don't get their feelings hurt. And if you're dead in Christ, you shouldn't have all those problems. It says live in peace. And then he says something else there. He says uh, peace without spot and blameless. What are you doing in your life to get the spots off? What are you doing in your life? You, you wear a nice suit out to eat. And you go to, as I did not long ago, got a, a suit last fall on sale. Butch went out and bought one just like it. As a matter of fact, it's the suit he's wearing this morning. I have one just like it. And I had mine first. He liked to copy me, but that's beside the point. But we went down to a, to a Chinese buffet. Michael took us all out to eat to a Chinese buffet down in Oxford. And by the way, they have good food. And it's not just Chinese food. They have crab legs. They have shrimp of a dozen different kinds. They have oysters on the half shell. Mm -hmm. So when I got home, Carolyn said, what'd you get on your jacket? I said, nothing. I looked down, there was a spot of something red right on the new jacket. So what I do, just ignore it? Did I just say, oh, there's no spot there. Carolyn, that's your imagination. Just don't look. You won't notice it. I'll just keep my, my jacket button. Nobody will notice I got a spot. No, what I do, I took it and got it cleaned. You ladies, if we made as much preparation for Jesus coming as you ladies make for cleaning your house when company's coming, we wouldn't have any trouble. Company's coming, what do you do? Everything's got to be clean. We have some company coming middle of this month. We found out yesterday Floyd's going to come up for a while. Going to spend a couple days at our house. So what do you think Carolyn's going to do just before Floyd gets there? Gary, you better get that carpet cleaned. Gary, you better get that floor mop. No, she won't do that, but I'm guaranteeing you she's going to want the house clean before Floyd gets there. Right? If we realized and was looking for the second coming of Jesus, we'd do that same type of housekeeping and house cleaning with our spiritual lives. We wouldn't let that anger or that envy or that gossip or that uh, lustful thinking or that evil thinking or that evil speaking. We'd get rid of it and we'd confess it because Jesus might come before I'm done talking right now. We wouldn't want it and he doesn't want it. Verses 17 and 18, it says we need to be careful about who leads us. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before... Beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. You know what mob mentality is? Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, Seattle, all these places they had all these um, uh, protests. It's mob mentality. You get one person out on a street, He's not going to throw a fit. But you get 20 people out on the street, and they feed off one another, and they begin to throw a fit. You know what the world does to the believer? They surround us, and in that surrounding, they try to entice us to become a part of their mob. They get around us. They so saturate everything around us, and they try to pull us away from our steadfast standing as a Christian. Well, I don't drink. Well, why don't you drink? A lot of Christians do drink. Well, why don't you drink? Well, I don't drink because... Well, you know, a lot of Christians don't believe that, and they drink. Why don't you drink? Well, I don't drink because... But you know that this good Christian I know down, they drink, and why don't you drink? And Well, I don't drink because... And they cut you off, and they don't want to know why you don't drink, because you don't drink because the Bible says you shouldn't drink. Well, why don't you come run around with us tonight? We're going to go bar hopping and chase women. Well, I don't do that anymore because, well, come on, we're going to have a good time. When I, I, well, there's going to be a bunch of us do it. Every parent in this room has heard this. Everybody's doing it. You know what I tell my kids when they tell me everybody's doing it? Not everybody's doing it because I'm not doing it, and I'm somebody, and that means not everybody's doing it. And then I also tell them, well, everybody may be doing it, but you're not doing it because I have to give answer for you. Now, does that mean they don't do it? No. But if they do it, they do it over my objections, right? Well, that's the way God does us. He doesn't want us falling into this mentality. Well, other good people are doing what's, what the Bible says is wrong and wicked and evil. So you, you're just going to have an excuse because you're going to fall in with them and let them lead you. 
I thought I was doing something really nice for my wife. We have this pond we've had forever in the backyard. It's about maybe half again as big as this pulpit with a little fountain in it, you know. So every year I just leave it alone. Next year I pull that fountain or the, the pump out and I clean it all up, stick it back in there, and plug it in, it works. So I changed the water and fixed it all up and it's working. The other day I looked in there and there was a frog in there. I don't know what kind of noise a frog in the water makes, but you can hear him from inside or could. Went out there yesterday, that old frog was belly up and dead. I mean bloated belly up and dead. Now my point is this, you can live in that stagnant, stinking pond with a dead frog if you want to. But that's not where God wants you to stay. You can live with your nose in the pig pen like the prodigal son if you want to. But that's not what God wants you to do. He wants you to realize that through this book and the teachings and the preachings of this book and the learning of this book, you can be led to a higher life than you've ever experienced. You don't have to stay where you are. God in the book of Psalms didn't say to the old guy down there in that pit, uh, somebody said, well, Confucius said, if you can follow my advice, you can get out of that pit. And Islam says, well, if you can work your way part way up, I'll get you the rest of the way. Jesus jumps down in the pit, and he picks you up, and he takes you out of the pit. He puts you on a solid rock. You don't have to stay where you've been. You just need to let Jesus start leading your life. You don't have to go to hell when you die. You can go to heaven if you let Jesus become the Lord of your life. If you ask Jesus for salvation, he's going to give it to you. If you ask Jesus for forgiveness, he'll give it to you. If you ask Jesus for love, he will give it to you. If you ask Jesus to be the master of your life and keep you safe, he will do that for you. We don't have to be led away. God proves his integrity. There are people in this room that I guarantee you that if you knew their background, you'd say, I never would have believed that they were that bad. There are people in this room that if you knew their background, you'd say, well, how in the world could they possibly? But they're not that way now. What happened? I, I like it. In one part of the Bible, it gives this long list of evil things. And then the writer in, the, in that passage, I should have looked it up, says, and such were some of you. You used to be, but God changed you. God proved himself true. God proved his character is, is incorruptible. God proved that he loved you, and he brought you up out of that horrible pit. So when you think about the coming of Jesus, what should it do? It should make us want to be more like him. In 1 John, it tells us, in that, and I think it's chapter 3 in that one also, where it talks about that if we have this, this hope within us, the hope of the second of the appearing of Christ, uh, we will cleanse ourselves. Peter says, hey, you're doubting the integrity of God? You're doubting the integrity of God. What do you even know about God? You're doubting that back there in time memorial, he created the heavens and the earth. What do you even know about that? If he didn't create it, how did it get here? Well, Darwin says you just became a little tadpole, and you flopped up on the seashore and scratched a place and it became an arm and you scratched the other side and it became an And this took place over billions of years, by the way, millions of years. Does that make sense? No. Well, the Big Bang Theory, just someplace out there all these cosmic gases got together and exploded and everything that is came into existence. Does that make sense? No. Then why do we fuss so hard to do away with God created the heavens and the earth? makes a whole lot more sense. Why do we then argue about Jesus is not coming? Or if he's coming, when's he coming? Or if he's coming, do I even care that he's coming? Yeah, he is coming. And when he's coming is still a big question mark, maybe before the day is over. But if he tarries, it's simply so we can tell more people about Jesus so they can be saved. Well, if he's coming, why should I care? Because we should want our lives to be representing our Savior when he comes. Not wallowing in that muddy old pond with a 
belly up, dead, bloated frog, but living a life of purity for our Savior. Now, in the days of Noah, that preacher preached 120 years and nothing happened. In modern times, if preachers preach and nothing happens, we wonder if they're doing their job. Well, I can only tell you this. I did my job this morning. I preached the truth of the Word of God. What you do with that, that's on your shoulders. You can either say, Lord, you know, the Word of God says I need to be clean. This area of my life's not right. It says I need to live in peace, and you know I've got a grudge against so-and-so, and and this sister so-and-so, and and brother so-and-so, I'm not too happy with them either. Or you can get right with God this morning. We can confess our sins. We can find forgiveness. And the Bible says cleansing from all unrighteousness. Or we can go out like we came in and ignore what the Word of God said to us. The choice is yours, just like it was to the people Peter was writing to. He didn't make them. He didn't even tell them anything new. You remember what he said? He said, I'm telling you these things to stir up the remembrance of your righteous minds. I hope your remembrance is stirred. Remembering how good it is to be in favor with God and close to the Lord. Father, I pray this morning that you would speak to hearts. As we have this invitation, I pray that you would have your will done. If there are those here that need to confess sin and get to this old, old-fashioned,